Claris today. I'll just say welcome everybody. I'm Rosemary. I think I recognize pretty much every name and face. Um, I'm the community engagement manager at Claris. So I I keep the the online community and developer groups humming, humming along, I guess. And also I'm working on content and other things for Claris Engage Beyond. So I hope you are all registered for the keynote or kickoff on the 25th. We hope to see you there. And apologies to Darren that it's in the middle of the night for you. It's actually 10 a.m. here in Melbourne. It's it's Vince that's caught up in the, the middle of the night in, in <laughs> Germany. So only for another month. <laughs> oh, you're yeah, heading back okay. again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So uh, tonight is an open discussion meeting. It, there, there is no special speaker for for this evening, uh, but we do have a theme. So we can like bring up any topic we want. But we, Vince and I, talked about just starting off with the theme of, you know, things that we manage. You can see in the background I've got here, you know, anything under that manage menu, um, like from layouts to value lists, security, so on. Um, yeah, that's our starting point. So if there's anything under there, ways that you manage that information or that those parts of your schema, those parts of your database, uh, that's what we'd like to start off with. And then uh, we could talk about other things after that. Okay. Um, and if you want, I could go ahead and uh, see if I can share that one thing that... Uh, Let's see if I can, how do I get my share back on? All right, you see my screen there? Oh, sharing the wrong screen. Just, sorry, stop sharing. Share my whole desktop. All right, you can see that. So as soon as I, I uh, brought this up, it was at Nick. How do you pronounce his last name? Um, Nick Shopin. How do you guys pronounce that? But he uh, he he sent me this, and he was the first thing he thought of when I when I sent out the announcement with the, with the description. You notice anything different about that manage menu? All the all the shortcuts. Shortcuts. Yeah, he put shortcuts on everything. I asked him, uh, how, well, and I I assumed he used. Uh, uh, custom menus. He actually just used the, I guess, Apple preferences or something like that, and that stuck to all those on there. Um, of course, I didn't exactly like that answer because then that means well that wouldn't that wouldn't help the people I work with who are using Windows. Um, so just out of curiosity, if I were to use custom menus, I would be able to do this, correct? Because I haven't used custom menus that often. I think I did a couple things years ago, and I never actually played with it much since then. But could you do the same thing with custom menus? I believe you could. Um, I have to give it a try. I don't know. I guess you could. No one here is uh, messed with much with custom menus either. I I did Pretty a little sure. bit. Yeah, I've done a little bit as well. I think you can create keyboard shortcuts for the menus, but I don't think you can populate the existing manage menu with your own keyboard like the, like you're seeing there um, i think the custom menu would be your own menu rather than the built-in you could replace them replace all the menus with your own ones if you're that way inclined uh, to make a a faux menu rather than the existing one but your own one but it'll be a lot of work because yeah, as, as soon as he brought this up it it brought to mind some other idea i had a while back and that's you know i was always working with other developers and not necessarily terribly organized, but you know, sometimes you're wondering, like, did this change? Did somebody change this? When did they change it? And I was thinking, well, if I could get a custom menu to intercept this, you know, these dialogues, so that when it, anybody comes into the database, secure, you know, to, to manage anything, whether they're looking at it or, or or updating it, if it could log that somewhere, so that I could see that somebody went in and out of the, you know, to manage a layout or went in and out to, well. That one doesn't actually make as much sense, but you know, the database or security or something like that. 
where it would actually log it, maybe even give an opportunity to make a note about what they did when they went in to manage security mm -hmm. or databases or valueless for that matter. That I I would love to see a script trigger that could be um, piggybacked off of any catalog change. So like you get out of value lists and you made a change, yeah. and you could run some kind of script trigger to 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 do something with that. Um, that would be that would be really interesting. I think it's um, possible uh, from a from a developer. Uh, uh, Claris would have to provide that. We, uh, we don't. Yeah. I don't. I like. I'm just looking at the the custom menus now. I wonder. I wonder how you would do that to do. Um, I, the manage. I don't think you can. Yeah, right? because. Eric, just concerning the the custom menus, if if I may interject. Oh, who's this? It's it's Robert. It's Robert. I'm sorry, yeah. I joined late. Oh, that's good. Um, Thanks. So it, with uh, with custom menus, I think uh, you, you'll be able to assign um, a specific shortcut, keyboard shortcut, if the menu is is available in uh, in custom menus. Um, something else is for some of those very actions. Um, there exists matching script steps, okay? So oh. without saying that you would customize the original menu, you mm -hmm. could very well implement um, um, a new menu item uh, that that does the same thing. Like I think Manage Database is, is one of those uh, that is available via script step. And then for this custom menu item, implement your own keyboard shortcut. Um, so there are a couple of things that, um, that can be done. But um, with custom menus, there are a couple of things that are um, off limits, especially when we think of the the native um, elements. Like for instance, um, I forget what it is, but I think there are there are things from the um, from the original, uh, say the um, the pie chart um, when when you're looking at the um, at the record count, um, like toggling. In between, um, like showing omitted records and things like that, that you can't uh, piggyback on and, and tie a custom menu to because the the, com the menu command is not available with custom menus. Hmm. Oh yeah, because I see. Okay, how many we got there? We got six. I'm looking over to the right here. We got open menu items. We got six of those on the, under the scripts possible scripts we can do. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of these. There's a, um, a shout out to Matt Petrasky. There's a really good technique for doing custom keyboard shortcuts. We do it here. Um, it's Mac only, but it's very powerful. So if you're a developer working on a Mac, I, I dropped a uh, link to a post that I put out there, uh, which has an infographic of the choices that we made as well as a, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as a shell script that if you just quit FileMaker, run the shell script, open FileMaker, you'll see that you'll have about 20 additional uh, keyboard shortcuts, including all of the managed ones and uh, a bunch of others that we found most useful. Uh, original idea was uh, Matt Petrowski, maybe someone else. That's where we saw it first. Uh, and we kind of like it and ran with it. Um, shell script and an infographic at the link in the chat. Mm. Thanks. Thanks, Tony. So when an update comes along, do you, would you have to rerun that if you do a FileMaker update? And does the update mess anything up or get messed up um, because it, you did this? It writes to a P list, so the shell script is essentially write to P list. Um, and if there's an update, or if you want to just change the shortcuts that you're using for whatever reason, you just run it again and it works fine. Or you just, I think you can trash the P list and and just run it from scratch. I've had no issues. It, it just seems to work. Cool. Uh, I, I, yeah, I think it sticks as long as the application name remains the same. Um, so perhaps like if you have um, a set of um, of keyboard shortcuts that are defined for, say, FileMaker 17, when you uh, first install FileMaker in 18, it's not going to have your, your, your shortcuts. Um, but I think now, um, like for instance, with 19, we, we've had many releases where the, the name of the application as it stands in in the um, 
in the uh, application folder is is not different than than anything else. You know, like the version number keeps uh, incrementing, but the, the name of the application I, I think is not changing. Mm. And there are some, you know, preferences and even some like recent files and server lists that persist across even full versions. So I think some of that is just under the hood is still com.filemaker.client.pro12 <laughs> and that just never changes. So as you were, as you were saying, Robert, um, so I would have to, I couldn't change this one. I would have to create a new menu. Well, it really depends when you go into uh, the, the, the interface that is given to you to, to customize menus. Like mm -hmm. if, if, if that specific menu item is there for you to customize, you, oh. you will be able to, to assign um, a keyboard shortcut to it, you know? So it's going to be not in the menu sets, but on the, on the other uh, panel you got. Um, this one here? Yeah, the custom top menus. right. Oh. Yeah, custom, custom menus. menus, you know, so in here, um, maybe if you look at, uh, yeah, Famicom Pro copy and edit, because it's in, or file, yeah, in file. Oh, I see. Let's, let's look at the file one and say edit, you know. Um, then you have manage and manage is a sub menu. Um, and right now it's just, um, the sub menu itself is not, uh, is not customized. So you could see if you create a new menu that is based on manage and, and, and see that you, you handle the, the items in there. Um, like, mm. are you going to be able to customize those? Those specific items. So I've 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 never looked at um, that that one uh, panel because most systems I'm involved with um, those type of things are are all restricted to uh, to full access accounts. Um, but uh, I've 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 done a fair bit of of things about uh, about uh, custom menus and um, and yeah there are, there are things that uh, are there for you to uh, to to know and use, but uh, it's not necessarily easy or obvious. Like for instance, if you want to make something um, be grayed out or show the thick mark, um, it's, it's possible, but it's not just like a, like a checkbox in, 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 in how we manage custom menus. So mm. maybe we should have a presentation on custom menus then at some point. Yeah, yeah somebody made a really good use of it too. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. if, if we could find somebody who made really good use of it. Well, there's a couple of, of neat things about it. I mean, it, there's, there's even some items that you can customize that, uh, will, um, will take effect on the, uh, the contextual menu when you, when you right click in a record, you know, um, so, but oh, yeah, for, yeah. for sure you, you, you need to be, you need to be creative, you know, and, and I think, um, we're, we're more and more in a space where even the traditional menu, people don't don't go into it so much. They are uh, kind of expecting the commands to all be available as as part of the 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 app UI itself, like buttons and commands and and, and popover and and whatnot. Um, plus, you know, when when we even for someone who decides to to um, go all out and and have a, a custom menu implementation. Um, that custom menu implementation doesn't um, translate very well if your app is also being consumed via, say, uh, Famicom Go or or even WebDirect. So oh. um, the the time and effort that you put in in there will will give you a very polished uh, finish. But depending on on the different uh, access points you you may have, you 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 want you want to. Uh, like it's a calculated decision. I think if you if you have a product that is a, a vertical, um, it's it's a it's a no brainer. You you quite literally um, should be doing a custom menu because it it gives that uh, that that polish that is that is very nice. Um, but if you if if you're talking about a 
a, a single app um, that is used in a single company. Um, whether or not you choose to um, to um, to go all out on on custom menus, it, it's uh, yeah you have to pray uh, to to weigh the pros and cons. Yeah. So yeah, with us, uh, yeah, me being an in-house developer, generally that yeah we don't have to worry too much about that kind of polish. But but on the other hand, there's uh, being able yeah, and a lot of the users actually have access to most of the menu items and have gotten used to those. So, but every once in a while, you think, well, now that they're used to that menu item, it'd be nice if I could change the behavior of that menu item so that it does a little extra or doesn't doesn't work, you know, works differently so that it does what mm -hmm. the developer really wants it to do as opposed to just the default behavior. Yeah, I think what we do see a lot is people using it to to lock down access to things that are uh, oh, that a, a bit uh, a bit dangerous. Like for instance, uh, maybe yeah, people the will say, menus, hey, yes. Yeah, the, the, like delete all records and and replace field contents and yeah. th those type of things. You know, sometimes you, you're saying, well, um, let's uh, let's hide them away or or something like that. So stuff like that or or stuff that will be um, making what's there compliant with um, with buttons that are on the interface. Like if you have a, a specific script that matches uh, when people are um, creating new record in a given table, well, um, it, it could be nice that uh, if they summon new record from the native menu that your script uh, fires off yeah. instead of just like having a, a blank record and, and nothing else of the, of the actual logic that you, you expected from it. So. so that's the sort of thing you can do then? Oh yeah, there's, there's a ton that can be done with, uh, with custom menus. Yeah, it's also worthwhile mentioning that if uh, Christian from Monkey Bread were here, um, he would definitely say, uh, you can do anything with uh, Monkey Bread. Monkey bread you know? <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, I definitely sh not not mocking it. I'm just saying no, that right. uh, he, he could, uh, if, if he really wanted to, to do, uh, you know, the menus the way you wanted to them to be, you know, also the contextual menus and I, I I don't have all the, the details of of how his contextual menus would work, et cetera, but there's a lot you could do with his plugin um, in terms of menus. And I'll say one other thing, and that is when um, Christopher Krim and Clay gave a, a talk about or presentation about custom menus a long time ago, um, when you add a custom menu, and you choose it to be um, based on another menu. So like if you go to layout mode, uh, I believe there are menus that are available in layout mode only. And if you add a menu that is based on a menu that is only available in layout mode, I believe it inherits the properties of the fact that it will only be available in layout mode or something along those lines. Hmm. So there's, yeah. uh, so if you base it based on a command that already exists, then it, it kind of inherits the properties of that command. Does that make sense? Yes, that, is, that is right. And, and a good example for, for that when I was, uh, uh, saying earlier that if you want a given menu item to, to be grayed out, for instance, um, it, it's not like we, we don't have in, in the custom menu definition something where um, it's, a, it's a tick box or a check box or, or just a, a calculation that says, hey, disable if, and then you, you specify your calculation. Um, but for instance, if you know that uh, the feature is um, something that you that you want to be grayed out when you're in browse mode, okay. Well, if you if you create a, another menu item that is based on a feature that is only available in fine mode, you know, like typically stuff that that targets the the requests, okay. Well, then um, because in in browse mode those very items are are not available and and they they in browse mode they will appear grayed out, you know. Um, so then it, it just becomes a, a matter of making sure that your two menu items, the, the display of them is, is 
mutually exclusive that that you have a high condition uh yeah the install when to say um on this one install it if uh if i don't want things to be grayed out and on the other one install it when i want it to be um grayed out hmm. but uh, but the installer in itself does not control the looks of it it's really to um to base it off something um that is not available in the in the menu you're you're into like for instance right now you're into file copy so if in here you go in and you create a brand new item okay um oh like just new right here yeah creates yeah okay and in in there you you choose the menu command uh menu item type with a drop down and and um you say command and base it on existing okay so the checkbox uh, right underneath okay mm -hmm. and then you look for something um that that would be uh, only available in uh in um fine mode um so yeah. a new new request perhaps new record not new, not new record that i think there's something specific to request um Ex extend found set or condense found set yeah. Yeah. Normally yeah. appears on request. There we go. Um, so you could name that thing whatever you you want to to name it. Um, but in in the it would make it it would make it so that in your um, the uh, with the item name down below. Um, the checkbox item name. Yeah. Just um, override default I behavior. See. Yeah. Okay. So. You could call it my grayed out feature, okay? And um, and because it's based on something that is not available in in browse mode, it would be it would be grayed out. And you if you make it so that it's available both in browse mode and in fine mode, then when you're going to switch to fine mode, it's going to be it's going to appear available. And and that is because the behavior is based off the existing command extend found sent. Even if you later choose to make the action perform a, a script that has nothing to do with the with the 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 feature is based off okay so An another way of saying we can totally mess you up <laughs> it's <laughs> there's there's a good number of things about custom menus uh that can get fancy let's let's put it this way but it's very interesting what you can do and achieve with it um, mm -hmm. but I don't see a lot of people who, who, uh, who go that far. And, um, I quite honestly, um, would have preferred to, to have like a calculation that says disable when, um, or show a tick mark if, um, because it, it's the same for the, uh, for the things that you have when, um, say when, when you're in a layout and, and you're looking at the, the view menu options, and there's one that tells you if you're in in browse or or uh, preview or whatever, the one that is selected has a tick mark next to it, you know. And and if you're in form view and list view or in detail uh, or table view, the one that is selected has a tick mark next to it, and and you cannot do that um, with custom menus unless you make sure that your new menu item inherit the property of something like that, yeah. and then you have to go through an extensive amount of of "Quote unquote cheating," um, to 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 say, okay, well, um, I'm going to um, implement this. If I'm in form view, um, I'm going to make it so that it it derives from something that uh, implements the 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 form view behavior, but it's it's going to uh, be labeled something else, and and so on and so on. So, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but that's. Uh, I mean, it, when I said maybe we should have a presentation on custom menus, I, I, I quite literally mean it. it. It's a topic in itself. Yeah. Um, but it, it's there's not a large crowd, that, as far as I'm concerned. That. Uh, well, yeah, and it, it would have to have it would. I mean, a presentation like that would have to have things that would interest, you know, people like me who, you know, I'm not I'm not trying to do a vertical product or you know mm -hmm. selling anything typically. But you know something that would be you know generally useful to you know yeah. using yeah. FileMaker or managing it for that matter. Yeah, yeah. So I I don't know about the uh, 
the agenda for for tonight and and how tight or not tight we we wanted it to be to to custom menus so i'm oh yeah so well yeah so we don't one 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 comment before we jump off custom menus a shout out to the engineers over at FileMaker who added it to the list of objects that you can copy and paste as the FileMaker 17 oh. if you come up with an awesome uh, idea for custom menus and you have a multi-file solution you need only do it once and then you mm -hmm. can subsequently copy it from file to file to file and so forth and so on 17 and up nice and also, go back to your screen one second, Eric. Uh, sure. I don't know what team worked on custom menus, but go back to your custom menu dialog that you had open. Manage custom menus. So open up. Um, I think that last one. I think it was that you this were one? working on. Yeah. Or the I was looking at file. Oh yeah. Go ahead, uh, open that one up. Um, you look at menu name and to the right of it, it says used in menu sets one. That's the, that's the only place I've ever seen a reference of something like, um, this ID? menu, yeah, like that, that it gives you even a reference of like where it's used. Like, for example, imagine if you would value lists and you're looking at a value list and it tells you like used in oh yeah you know, five other places or reference mm. you know now show them to me <laughs> yeah 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 and now show them to me well, well, it's you're, you're talking like the guy yeah. who did who uh made inspector pro or something like that yeah yeah i, I pay attention to those to those like little highlights but it's curious because it's almost like uh i think it was a different team that worked on custom menus and mm. i don't know I, I don't know exactly. Yeah. Somebody was there who said, hey, that would be nice to know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, anyway, curious tidbit. And there's another thing too. I don't know if you can do it. Oh yeah, so you see how, okay, can, click okay on this dialog. Okay. Okay, so uh, you can't hit return to get out of this dialog, right? Well, so, yeah, because it's going to go right back to edit, unless right. But if you not... select, if you select two menus, if you select two menus, now oh, you can hit return. That's peculiar. Yeah. <laughs> so someone pointed this out to me a long time ago, and it's the same behavior with value lists. So you go into a value list, and you're editing a value list. And you make it, you know, you, you, you go in there and you, you say, okay, I'm going to change one of these value lists. And then, uh, so click on, click on value list. That's going to edit go, it. Yeah, edit it. And then you say, okay. And then you want to get out of this other dialogue by clicking, okay, hit nope. return, but you can't. So what you do is you hit, okay, but then you hit the up arrow. I think it's up arrow. No, no. Uh, you, you have one selected, then I think you shift up arrow or shift down arrow. Oh. There you go. Well, it's, now yeah, you it's multiple. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. as long as so you have long multiple, you have selected, multiple selected, selected, you, um, you um, now have, have an okay. hmm. hmm. does, does function return work there for a single line? Uh, for a single line, single function, line? function yeah. return. Hmm. Yeah, echo. Yeah, no. Uh -oh. Okay. Uh -oh. That's weird. That's weird. <laughs> Works in a calculation dialog and some of the other dialogues, but not there. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. All the changes yeah. I need. Huh? <laughs> All right. I think we've exhausted that topic. Okay. Good. <laughs> Not really. Anybody else? I've, I've heard no. there's a whole other meeting just on custom menus. <laughs> All right. So, what else we got? Um, I'll share something real quick. Something okay. pretty pretty easy. Um, so, let's see here. There we go. All right. So, um. Uh, something that's bothered me for a long time, and that is 
um, yeah, writing scripts, but not bumping into script triggers when you're writing scripts that navigate to layouts that have script triggers on them, et cetera. I mean, I, I've asked for disabling script triggers for a long mm -hmm. time, but then I oh. kind of. Oh yeah, I've seen that. Okay. Hey, hey yeah. Vince, what's your what's your screen resolution there? That's the. Uh, should I make it bigger? Is it too uh, small? Yeah. Yeah, well, for okay. me, anyway. Okay, so hold on one second. Monitors. Is that better? Um, now it is, yeah. Okay. So uh, one way I kind of um, get around this and also have less, less, less code to deal with is that um, I will have um, Two folders in the in the lay manage layouts area, and uh, let's say I add a table. So um, let's say test. Okay, so now I have a new table, and um, I have now a layout that has, um, you know, sometimes it. I don't remember now what what the rationale is with having the fields on the layout or not when you create the table, but Anyway, you would normally end up with a layout like uh, like a, a layout that's automatically created for a newly ta created table. So what I normally do is I put that layout in my data layout and I'll duplicate it. Oops, sorry. I'll duplicate it and I will move it into a scratch layout. Um, and then what I'll do is on my data layout. I'll get rid of all the fields and get rid of anything except just a body part. And, and so I have just a, a bare bones layout that has no objects on it, no triggers on it, nothing. And then I'll have a scratch layout that I use for debugging, um, scripting, uh, that maybe I need to go to this layout and, and see some data that um, I'm working with. And so my scripts and development uh, may point to uh, a layout that is in this scratch folder. And then when I feel good with the script that it's doing the right thing, I will point it to this layout so that, um, it's got, um, you know, it's got the right context, et cetera. Um, with the exception of some times you need a field to be on the layout. And so in that case, if I needed, I forget which or which are the steps that you need to have a field on the layout. I think it's so like insert. insert. Yeah, yeah, insert. So I will put that field on the layout and I'll, you know, maybe put something like do not remove and I'll lock and I'll lock it. But that's the only thing that would be on that layout. And so by doing that, uh, and all your scripts are basically always going to database uh, layouts that have the right context. And these layouts have no script triggers on them. And there's no objects on them. There's no portals. There's pretty much nothing here. Uh, and, and and the big advantage of that is, well, the big advantage of well, two two advantages. One, maybe load time. Like if you go to a layout that has a portal and some data and you know all this kind of stuff, there is. I'm pretty sure there's overhead and loading. Uh, you know, I mean, there could be styling, there could be local styling, there could be related records that you, maybe you land on a record uh, that has related records and then it's got to pull that data down and all that stuff. So, um, so there's advantages to it being maybe a little bit more performant, more lightweight. And there's a, um, there's a separation between, you know, the the stuff that you want to program and the stuff that you need to see. 
And then when, um, when you're done, what you could do is you could basically, um, you know, check to be sure that there's no references to these layouts that you have in the scratch folder, and then you could probably just delete them. So, so anyway, that's my little tidbit. Any, any questions? Well, I, I'd like to go even a, a little bit further than, than what you said, Vince, uh, in, in mm -hmm. how um, triggers can negatively impact your, your running script. Um, mm -hmm. Because oftentimes people will maintain the, the script that, that behaves as a trigger uh, completely separately from any other process that is um, having to go to, to a given layout and, and, and things like that. And they can do things in there that you don't want to see happening um, during your um, your main script, you know, uh, it can be as benign as uh, a refresh window script step or or things like that, or it can it can be other things that that are actually harmful for for what your script uh, needs to do. You know, if if it changes context and all of a sudden you're you're not where your script expects to to be, um, your script is still gonna keep running after being in, in the wrong context. And now it, it depends on, on how you error trapped for, for things to, to happen in a, in a different context. And on the topic of error trapping, um, the trigger, like say you, you do something and you, 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 you're attempting to trap for get last error, okay? But there's a, a triggered script that is raised in between your get last error and and the step that uh, that you're trying to uh, to check the error against, um, mm -hmm. that triggered script can completely flush out the last error. And and at that point, you 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 get the error, but even if your script is is trying to implement error trapping for it, it's gone. You don't get to see it. So oh, it it's it's very. Um, when when you are running your scripts, you you need to be sure that um, you're not going to trip over um, a trigger. Yeah, yeah. There's other um, so in in the in the theme of manage, there's other categories that we end up creating for some of these. So data and scratch is just one example, but we'll create also things like um api and if we use uh the execute uh what is it the execute uh execute data api is that the command where you're using the data api but lo uh, to fetch data from a layout so we'll put a layout in here that is dedicated for that purpose and so well, we kind of organize um things in in that way um uh, but th but this is this has come in real really handy um uh for us and then uh, yeah and then that way it's also more lightweight if you ever run an analysis uh you need to generate a ddr um if you if you have only layouts for all your tables as to table that it's the, the the first layout that is generated and it's got no fields on it then it, it doesn't have all this extra processing to do so sometimes uh when you're developing you point to scratch layouts for developing and seeing the result of your development and then when you're done you point to here and then if you remove these then basically you've got at least in my opinion the lightest weight um, um, you know, footprint on on uh, generating even the XML. Mm -hmm. Vince, I've been using that technique myself for quite a while, and the data tables that don't have any fields, run them in form view, and then mm -hmm. your your testing layouts put them into table view, so you can see the fields and what's going on with data, and even that function is a lot heavier if you're running a startup script to have a found set to present to the user and your startup script goes to a, a table that has 20, 30 fields on it, some of them are, are calculations, that is very heavy compared to coming to a straight form view where it's only loading that current record with no data 
compared to 25 records if it's list or the whole found set if it's table. So you, you can get a, a much better result by having no fields on a form layout rather than even just list. Yeah, no, that's a good point, Darren. Thank you. Um, I, I just extend your 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 comment there by a little bit, which is sometimes to avoid that hit on pulling a record, what what you can do is you can write a script that will just create a new window uh, based on the layout that you're currently on because you already loaded this data. Um, it's going to be just the overhead of creating the new window then enter find mode oops uh, enter find mode uh, and then uh, go to the layout that you want so this way you're already in find mode you go to the layout uh, you're not getting a hit on loading that record in that table and then uh, you would enter your criteria and find the record that you want so that's one way to also avoid um, a situation where what Darren was saying, which is if you go to a layout list view, you may expose this layout to show 25 records or something, and this is gonna communicate with the server to pull down those records, um, but doing it, um, having it be in form view, at least you're getting only one record or two, maybe it's caching the next or third record, whatever. Uh, but doing it this way, you're also avoiding actually ever pulling any record down because you're already in find mode when you get there. Um, does that make sense? Yep. Oh, absolutely. This, yeah. I, I don't have the under the hood specific, uh, but I thought that even in form view, it would pull 25 records preemptively. Yeah. Um, really? Well, that's my but impression, but I, like I said. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, I think it, uh, yeah, I forget what it was, but yeah, the, I, I was, I'd heard that the table view was st pulling a lot more extensively and then getting down to form would, was much less expensive than as far as. I think, uh, you know, plus one on what Vince just said, the primary optimization and it's a little bit of a counterintuitive script pattern when you look at it. You know, intuitively, you might think I'll go to the layout to establish context and enter the find mode. Just the opposite, as Vince just demonstrated, is the optimum approach. You enter the find mode uh, first, and then you go to the layout. Uh, and then, you know, when you do your find, you're going to find the records that you want to find. And so if you load them, that's actually a good thing. Thank you. I think I think what some of us when we got this new dialogue, what we wanted to see is, um, you know, an option to be in fine mode already. You know, like yeah, I know I have window. a feature request in for that. Oh yeah, for that very ask. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Cool. And put it in the chat. <laughs> yeah. And and for yeah, we'll vote for on card. It. I'll yeah, see for if card I can find it. For card windows too, I think mm -hmm. to be able to, uh, yeah. So, uh, and and while we're on the topic of um, of layout management, um, it it may overlap with uh, with menus and 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 navigation. But uh, uh, well, actually, Vince, if if you keep uh, sharing your your screen, mm -hmm. um, what I've what I've seen uh, some people do, and and that is when the the original chrome of the application is available to the user um they would put some uh some layouts that have nothing on them okay and and those layouts would only have the name of a given module and the, those blank layouts would have triggers on them um to to go to the to the matching uh modules so that they could name the actual um, layout whatever they want, um, and and what what the user would see in the in the drop down picker for for layout would be would be whatever they choose to 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 have the module be be named, um, and um, yeah, it it ended up being like for for navigation purposes and nothing else. But uh, that's interesting. Again, I I think um, there's 
less and less use of the of the native Chrome and, and and more of a tendency to just hide it all to, together and, and implement something um, that matches whatever UI we we have in the um, in the layout portion of the of the screen. But uh, yeah, something like that and using the the view as toggle that we see just to the right of it to uh, to again piggyback on the custom menus and and use that to toggle in between list view and detail and form view. Oh, but first so I using, like, yeah, go ahead. Using, this, using the same technique to toggle between these. No, no, no. The the but the oh. view as buttons. Uh -huh. You know, if you use custom menus on them, yeah, you could use that to implement navigation. That that switches from uh, from your oh, actual actual yeah. layout list view navigation to layout yeah. form view navigation instead of just being switching within the layout you're on in between yeah. for that layout form view and, and this view that's all oh that's that's cool that's I, yes. and you're using and you're using the chrome here that's already you're built using in. the native yeah. chrome yes yeah, yeah. yes that's awesome that's great huh. cool okay well that's my uh, that's my sharing hey i've got one that i can share and this is sure. this is one that's come up recently. Uh, let's see what happens when I share my screen. What are people saying at the moment? No, it's okay. readable. It's good. Hearing test. Yep. It's, uh, and equipment. It's a PNG. Yeah, it's a PNG. It's it's of a uh, the script dialogue where, uh, as part of my exit strategy for my current client, I'm taking one of the existing developers who's well versed in a lot of platforms, including um, PHP, Java, all, all the sort of things that as FileMaker developers we're getting to know. And I'm giving him a, an overview of how FileMaker works. Hmm. And essentially he's taking over the system that's been running for almost 10 years now, but he's finding it difficult using just plain human language to define fields, scripts, and functions and tables where the hearing test is my recent setup where they're the scripts I've been naming and the equipment are his naming conventions for similar functions where he's he, just to get his head right, he needs to talk about the context first, what layout he's in, and then the function. And a lot of the tables and fields and, and et cetera uh, are following that sort of convention. And we've had discussions where the fields, let's say for allocated date, he's lost if it has a space in it and it's not camel case. <laughs> really? <laughs> and oh, no. I knew it was going to always regress into like naming, naming conventions. And I'm like, I, under, I understand that you've you've come from a background where you're doing all this development that's, I'm going to say beyond the average file maker developer who doesn't have a computer sciences degree. And, you know, if we want to write a script that searches a hearing test, we call it search because that's the verb that we're doing. And then the context. And if I go into my search window, if I type in search uh, to filter out, I can see how all different functions are working. And if I'm adding a parameter to say, well, this search script for the, the hearing test is when we're doing a single or a multiple. That's the only real difference between these two scripts and the one before it calls it, that it, it came to this point of saying, he's finding it difficult to learn FileMaker because the naming convention doesn't make sense because it's not computer driven you know in this sort of idea um mm. and i've and i've taken over systems where this sort of equipment naming convention is in there and trying to use type ahead or finding elements or even relationship uh based on these you know i would love to go back to the day when we're going to put you know uh 12 characters in or 8.3 characters into things to to restrict what they can call these items um, but it's yeah, just this idea of a naming convention having to follow a particular convention rather than just straight English. 
Um, and the idea of the next developer taking something over um, is being as pure as possible to to a, a language that's understood outside of the, the environment. I'm not sure, you know, I, I want to open this up to other people's thoughts. Oh. Yeah. yeah have, have we ha have we seen this before? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a lot of people coming in from the you know the coding world, and they they're expecting to see things that look like code. Uh, that's that's probably the worst and most extreme example I've seen. But they, you know, it, it's like it it shows up too, like in layout names and other things that you know where some important. It's it's one thing I've not I mean, noticed with our our field names. We we tend to restrict that a bit in case it's going to be accessed by SQL. But everything else, we tend to we like to see it, you know, spaced out and human readable things that we would expect to see in a in a user interface menu, not something you'd find stuck down in code somewhere. Oh, even things like field um, names, just to be able to export, you know, do an, a straight mm -hmm. export. The user is going to have an Excel export of the fields. Yeah. They need to be in English. They need to understand them. Yeah, um, your average yeah, person doesn't want camel case. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, it's it like everyone's going to have different opinions on on convention, and and it, it depends on on how it's being used. Um, what I think is conventions should be should be just that they should be conventions. Um, like I I may like to to have something that will be say camel case or whatever else. Um, but I, I want to still be able to to choose when I branch off from what the convention is for whatever reason that is. I don't want to be working in a system where the system will impose on me what name a given object has to have or else uh, right. things are not going to work, you know? So um, that, that's okay. all I would say. What is yeah. that con convention over consistency? What was that? Uh, thing that they had with Ruby, they have this manifesto, I forget what a convention over configuration or something like that. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it was. But I yeah. th I'll add one other comment, and that is from my friend Steve, who kind of said this to me once, because, you know, if you're a developer going into someone else's solution, and you're helping out or you're you're going to go build something else. One of the things he said was, well, you know, this looks like this developer is using camel case and I don't like camel case. So I'll, I'll just stick with camel case. I mean, he's doing it. Uh, I'll just be consistent. So I'll follow the, I'll follow the trend of what he's already established. She or he has already established. And, um, I think the way he described it is like when you go to a country, you try to follow the customs of that country. You don't try and say, where's the next McDonald's? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, and and to me, that was that was kind of really a really nice way of saying, you know, be respectful of what someone else has already done. And, you know, it's also try not to impose your way of thinking all the time, try and be open-minded. So I don't know, I, I kind of have a looser approach to to stuff like that these days um, and try to look at it more from a point of view of consistency being more important than, you know, trying to force my view, so to speak. But that's, anyway, just. Yeah, and I think that also goes along with lines that we had back in the graphic design days of learn the rules before you want to break them. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Th they've been in that way for this reason for many, many a time. Find out why things were done that way, get an understanding of them, and then come to the table with a new opinion. I don't know if it's a generational thing to say, well, I'm going to not even just question what you're doing. I'm going to do it my way. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way it is. Um, and there's some some fidelity as to why we've done things these way, you know, and, and particularly in this case, it's for the next developer. The next developer is going to come in and find 48 sections of this system all done one way and one uh, module of the system done a completely different way. Um, so, yeah, that's that consistency. You go to a different country, you take your shoes off at the door if that's the, that's the culture and you respect how mm. things are. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's there's anything and everything. I mean, consistency is is always great to to have if if we can have it. And and I mean, we've all seen some some systems where things were more like a a patchwork, you know, where uh, over the years, like the developers had changed, and then or or even uh, even if it was a single developer, you know, um, the the way that they would code would evolve over time, and and you would see quite literally like periods of of okay, here is the style of of those years, and and the earlier years the style was was different, and and they don't necessarily have the luxury to to rewrite everything they they've written um, prior because now they're they're doing things in the in a new style. So um, we're we're bound to see. Um, a mixture of things, I, I think, and 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 how we want to to be doing things uh, going forward is is really about um, making making informed decisions. Um, on my end, I, I do service customers that are both uh, sometimes um, in English language and sometimes in French language. Um, but when I code, I I find myself mostly coding in English. Um, sometimes even in systems that that are French based. Um, and so I'm, I'm, there's not always a, a, a clear cut answer to, to say, well, uh, here, do it always like this. And, 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 and it, it is the one way, but, um, uh, um, yeah, it, those are, those are great, uh, philosophical, uh, discussion, um, on, on the managed topic and, and, um, there is one thing I, I, I have to, to say and share, I don't have a, uh, a, a screen capture or, or or anything about it, but it, it's fairly simple. It's about uh, uh, team and styles. Uh, I've found that um, it can be challenging, especially in a team, to um, understand the possible ramifications of changing a style when you roll it into the, um, the team. Um, and what I think has helped is um, first, if we have a given layout that shows the implementation um, of, of pretty much all the, the, the possible styles, um, that getting into the discipline of saying, well, I'm not going to change my, my style over here in, in the layout where it's implemented. I'm going to go to my main board, you know, um, where all my styles are, and I'll, I'll define it there. It, it kind of um, trains you in, into weighing um, the possible ramifications. Uh, so that's that's one thing. And the other thing is uh, I find it useful to have a backup team of of whatever team you're you're working with, because if you do change a given style, um, and you realize after the fact that um, the style has impacted things that you you didn't want to to impact. Um, it it can be difficult to to roll back that change if 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 you don't have um, something else readily available that gives you oh these were the settings for um, the actual colors or or the actual size or points of of thickness and and this and that. Um, so if you if you simply do a a, a copy of your of your team, um, then even if you perform changes that are um, breaking changes, if I may say, even if it's just styling, uh, then you can go into your backup and, and say, OK, for the same style, what were the settings? And take those exact settings and reapply them in your, in your live, quote unquote, live uh, team. Yeah, I kind of do that. Well, I usually just take you know existing things i know it's, all the people who are great at things probably laughing at that but but i just take usually an existing one just add a plus to it and say well this is this is mine and i've the ones i've you know the, the one that i've changed and i leave the original one alone if i can yes and yes I, yes but but yeah. sometimes you you will make so many changes and that will become your your live and active version you know oh, and, and then oh, and, so you keep keep leapfrogging and, that huh? yes yes because if if you want to get back to something and and sometimes the the original one may be too far, you know. So, um, yeah. 
along along the lines that Robert's talking about, we maintain a separate file that we call theme style repo uh, because we're not. I have to confess, we do a lot of projects where we use the same theme because it's well thought out and it's a migration of our previous uh, user interfaces pre theme. So a separate file uh, and and be very careful when we make a a new uh, style. And then we update it occasionally. Separate file. I also like to look to the real world examples of this type of thing. And I don't know if anyone's done any art history, but with church design and and the fact that a church may take 300 years to, to actually construct, the spires on some of the churches, the same church will have multiple different styles of spires because that was the trend in the next century. And so if you can find some examples of some um, churches through Europe, they'll have multiple spires be, styles because that was a trend in, in that particular time and the, the architecture or architect, the person who did the original drawing is nowhere around, around 100 years later. And so they've decided, no, I'm going to do it my way. And so, yeah, you end up with a mix, um, good or bad. You decide. And some of us just look at it ignorantly and go, oh, that, that was all that was the theme. <laughs> I, I have a question for the group uh, concerning custom functions, because when defining a custom function, it's possible to limit that custom function to only full access users. And I've mm -hmm. never used that feature. So I'm curious if there's anyone anywhere who's been using it, and if so, what what for? Hmm. I, I heard a good use of it a long time ago, but I, I don't know, I remember hearing some, some use for it, but I don't remember what it was right now. Um, I know we've used it in the code. I think it's potentially applicable when you're storing uh, cookies or keys or something like that, although that might not be best practice in some ways because uh, stuff shows up in the DDR. But even if, mm -hmm. um, so you have to run a when, full when, access it's, to get when it. it's run without full access, mm -hmm. what is it returning? Is it returning like question mark or? Well, I, I'm a big fan of the run script with full access, which can be part of an implementation uh, where you tie together some of the security features. You run with full access, but you hide it behind an account. Um, so, you know, having having uh, custom functions that can only be run with full access or fields and tables that can only be accessed with full access. Uh, if you tie it together with some of the other security features, can give you some interesting implications and Im implementations. Yeah, so wait, I'm curious. I don't know if you an answered this already, but if I'm running a script that that's running with full access, does that change? Does that make it work with this only accounts assigned full access privilege, or it has to actually be the account that that can you know the account itself actually has to have full access in order for this to work? If I check this, I don't know. Good question. We could find out right now. <laughs> well, this is a, so, I don't want to mess with this. Hey, <laughs> you shouldn't do that in the certification exam. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> so, yeah, no one's ever even um, used this feature. So, <laughs> yeah, one of the most and questions ever. I. There is something I can share about um, managing security, uh, and that is like in generally in all my tables, I'll create two fields uh, that are unstored calculations. Um, one is going to say um, edit is allowed, and the other one is going to say delete is allowed. And then when I go into um, manage security, I'll create a single privilege set. And that privilege set will, um, for for pretty much all tables, say, okay, you can delete the you can delete when, uh, and then the calculation definition is pretty simple because it's just 
you can delete when delete is allowed and you can edit when edit is allowed, you know, and then you just paste that through because if the field belongs to the exact table you're in, you don't even need to prefix it with the um, table occurrence colon colon. You just you just give the field name and, and, and you're good to go. Um, and then it makes it so it, it, it trims down um, the number of um, of privilege sets that that are required for for the system because pretty much everyone can be using the same privilege. It, it what really drives the security then is embedded in the um, the calculation of um, the unsort count for for each table. Hmm. So you're you're turning it on and off for situations or turning it on and off for. The, the delete for in what situations are you? Well, let let me see if if I'll um, I can come up with something um, that would have that implemented and and share my screen. Um, so let's see. Yeah, just while Robert's explaining, I've used a similar function in the onboarding of this new developer where it's a lot easier to explain the context and permissions from within the defined fields environment than to take them into the security and trying to explain how the different layers work within the security because it is a complicated dialogue. And so as part of the handover, if yeah, if you can set up that field as a calc that you can put into the data viewer, get it working and then it re reduces the need to head into the security area, particularly for newer developers in the FileMaker platform. Yeah, so let's see how I how I can share my screen. Um, share, share screen. So I guess yeah. you're seeing my screen now. Yeah. So so in here I have a table. The table is called document. Okay. And basically, if I say when it is that we can edit document, um, it's just going to say, okay, you can edit when edit is allowed. Okay. And, and that is an unstored calc um, that lives in, in that table. And if I go look at notes, you know, um, I, I look at this again, it's going to say, well, it's when edit is allowed. Now, this is a different field because it's in a different table, but I, I just don't have to even type note colon colon you know it's the, i don't need that because if there's only the the field reference it's going to look for that in the table itself um so in terms of setup you just take that you copy it and then you you paste it down your whole your whole set of tables okay um and it's just when you create new tables you need to to come in and and put it in and um and actually it's a shame that we can't uh have an act calculation to say when a user can or cannot create um, uh, a record in, in a table because we, yeah. we can we can we can design calculations for that they're, they're not going to be stemming from from the record because if you create the record quite obviously you don't have the record to start with um, but but it would be great if um, if um, if we could implement a, a calculation here so based on that you know um, Everything everywhere just says, okay, well, you, you can implement that when um, when when this resolves, and then when you when you, you're looking at um, any given table, okay, you can go in here and say, okay, well, what's the what's the calculation for this? Um, so in in this case, I'm I'm using Ham from um, Charles Delfs, um, but you could you could do anything, you know, you could say, oh, I want everyone to be able to edit, so I'll put it to one, okay? Or you could say, I want people to be able to edit only if it's Tuesday. So you would say, okay, uh, get uh, get current date, uh, get day equals to um, equals to whatever number Tuesday is in, in the week and, and so on. Um, so, so this is great. And the other thing is, mm. I mean, the, like Darren said, the um 
the dialogues for security are um, very thorough and, and, and so on and so on, but they, they only tell you what one given privilege set can do for everything in the system, okay? And I don't know in terms of questions that, that people are getting when, when security is involved, um, but I, I quite never happened to have come across someone who told me, oh, Robert, could you tell me everything that so-and-so can do? You know, mm -hmm. uh, the other way around, though, if I'm in into, say, uh, a table that is called invoices, OK, uh, I've had questions from people telling me, tell me, like, I want to know anyone who can edit invoices, you know, and, and this here lets you lets you get to to the answer on that. So. Well, but how do you yes, yes. what? Okay, so I, I've been dealing with because I I have to do security audits every every year, and I just I just did one, mm -hmm. and and I have to pull in, um, or essentially I have to go get a list of all the Active Directory groups. Uh, everybody's in it. Um, I go to the database designer uh, report to go get all the privilege sets and accounts that are in those all the files. I what else do I have to pull together? I'll get a list of all our files that are on the server. Um, uh, and I have to put all that stuff together and it gets kind of complicated because you have to simulate, well, these people are in multiple groups, but you know, the one that's the one that's on top, that's the one that, that they're actually using, you know, if they, if they log in, whichever one's on, on, you know, on the top of your security account list, if, if they, that's, you know, they're assigned that one, not the one that's down further on the list. And so I have to simulate that and put that all, all that together in tables to produce some sort of audit report that I can deliver to somebody and say, oh, and here's all the people who are using this system with this level of privileges. And um, I don't know if I, if I were doing something like what you just showed, how would that help me produce something like that? Mm -hmm. I was muted. Um, so basically, what what you what you talked about is external to FileMaker. You know, you, yeah. you're saying that uh, there's external authentication and mm -hmm. and the order in which people belong to some groups uh, will will let FileMaker know. Okay, you're into this group. So what's external to FileMaker? FileMaker has quote unquote no awareness about it. Okay, so it it wouldn't it wouldn't change anything and it wouldn't help. Uh, but once you're in FileMaker, you know, you actually know, okay, some, someone, once they're authenticated, they, they are um, under a given uh, privilege set, you know. So, in, if I may say, in a traditional rollout, okay, um, you have a system with, uh, with 20 tables and, and you have five departments okay so one is, is accounting another one is logistics another one is sales um and if you want to to answer the question of uh, who has access to what um to to go and drill down in each of the um the dialogues of security for each of of those privilege set is it's just it's exhaustive that there's yeah like a number of drill downs you have to go to. So if you have a single, um, if you have a single uh, privilege set where every user is is in there and everything is is driven by by the calculations, then um, you you don't have to go through fifteen dialogues to 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 figure out the answer to the question. You you look at the calculation and and you you get your answer right there. So I'm I'm not sure if it. It's answering your specific question in, in how um, it would help or not help. Like for things that are outside of FileMaker, uh, it, it cannot. Uh, mm -hmm. But once you're inside of FileMaker, you with with something like that, you you can say, well, here here are the conditions under which someone can edit the um, the invoices or can update uh, X, Y, and Z. So, mm -hmm. Eric. Eric, in that yeah. same system that I'm handing across, we have 
a possible a thousand uh, AD accounts that 300 of them have access to the FileMaker system. The IT department manage the AD groups and part of that management is we have a scripted export of the AD users yeah. and yeah. Okay. the AD groups. And then that's part of the nighttime script that comes into FileMaker. Each user has their own record in a table as part yep. of the startup process for just storing their defaults. And therefore you have that data from AD inside FileMaker to say, this user is in these groups. And you will have an external table that says, if you are in the admin group, this is what you're allowed to do. And so the management of someone moving from a standard user to an admin user is still handed by the AD, handled by the AD, but the reporting of who's in what groups is via those two exports out of AD, and then you can build up your own reports within FileMaker. That also departmentalizes the um, authority for the security in the system so that you're not having to change the FileMaker files when people move groups or such. It's still ha handled external and IT can handle the AD, the developers can handle what those permissions mean and then you have your project manager or your project owner with their own chart saying if you're an admin you're allowed to do this and so the priority the, also the authority stays with the three groups but that's been very helpful for us tracking down users who don't have the right privileges in certain areas yeah we, it sounds like we do yeah we do something very similar to that um the yeah, because it actually is an, also a night note export for us too, where we get the active director groups. It's kind of fun because uh, yeah, some of the, <laughs> it took me a while to figure out too. Some of the groups are groups of groups and you have to go follow down the tree and fetch all the uh, the, account, the actual person accounts down to the bottom. Um, and so, yeah, um, <laughs> it's complicated. Yeah, as the developer, who has access to what? Yeah, exactly. as a developer, you want to hand that over to IT and the project managers to handle the permissions. You don't want to have to dig into the files, particularly in a production system, to switch around permissions. And so you can hand that off to the other two parties and let them have the authority of that area. Hmm. Something that would be curious about is, um, does anyone feel like there are items where um, there should be other manage X Y Z in 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 the uh, in the file menu? You know, I don't. Yeah. I'm just I'm just thinking manage of manage fields, manage fields, so you can put folders in fields and group fold and group fields into folders categories. So oftentimes I see a lot of people try to underscore certain fields that they want to have as calculations and so they sort differently. Oh yeah. It would be it would be great to have a folder structure in the in the field so that you could say, here's all my ID fields, here's all my data fields, here's all my whatever, uh, here's my calculation fields, here's my summary fields, some kind of categorization based on grouping and for that matter, sometimes even just um, um, category groupings, let's say you have a lot of attributes in one table that represent a certain category of the attributes, like color or I don't know what it would be. And then, and then, but they're all part of that table. It would be great to have a folder structure right in the, in the, in the design database dialog. That you could easily see where thing, things are and group them. Yeah, there, there is one thing that I, I have been thinking of. Not that I would use it so much because it's 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 something that I shy away from from using, but uh, possibly for global variables, um, like if if you had to say define them before you get to use them, you know, you could have something that says 
manage global variables and and they'd have to be defined before you you get to invoke them and and manipulate them um because uh, i really don't don't like global variables and and how they they clutter the, the data viewer and 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 a bunch of things that you have to be careful okay. about with them and but one of of the things you have to be careful uh with is is spelling you know because you can you can just misspell it and 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 then you're you're not getting any type of warning or or anything like that so um i know it gets to it overlaps with with declaring variables even for local variables within within script but i i have mm -hmm. less issues with with that than with uh, than with global ones somehow well, I think I submitted this once as a, as a product idea, but I always thought mm -hmm. that, well, you know, this is a table, right? This is a table of all the fields in my table. So wouldn't it be nice if there was actually a meta tables file maker where you could actually find and sort and see all the attributes of your fields? Kind of like uh, I think like Oracle has stuff like that, right? When you you've got your all fields and all field columns, or is it what is it called? All tables, all all tab columns are these two meta tables that you can always look up all the tables that you've got and all the fields that are in them, um, and yeah. just treat it like a like it's another table in your database and go through there and look to see what's available. That actually mm -hmm. being able to modify things and something like that would be kind of interesting, but yeah, it would have to be some sort of special kind of table that you could have in FileMaker where you could actually see all those things. And then you could create your own interfaces, right? To to manage your fields. Yeah, well, I was gonna say, are, are you not getting that just from inspector or, or something like that? Well, you can view, but then you can't, you can't modify anything. Like what if I wanted to find um, all my global fields and make them unsort calculations or vice versa? You know, or something like that. Yeah, I, that yeah, that might be an extreme example. But mm -hmm. you know, go through and you know, I don't like this. I don't like this z underscore anymore. I want to make it z z. You know, creation science, science and be able to find all those and then change them using FileMaker's calculations to to, to to make modifications. Mm -hmm. Eric, there's a um, there's a powerful. I think it's underutilized feature in the platform, which is the design functions. Uh, one of the things that we built and, and use for a little bit of time is um, a system structure table where we we looked at every single design function to see what it gave us. We looked at also the execute SQL functions that query the underlying table and field structure, the kind of the two hidden tables. And we uh, built a system, a file that just basically queries uh, multiple files and extracts the layouts, the scripts, the base tables, the table occurrences, the relationships, the field, the layout fields, the layout objects, and so forth and so on, every single thing that the design function. So from that system structure table, we can uh, get some sort of overview so that if we want to, you know, do system-wide work for a particular field, we can locate where that particular field is you know, how many different base tables and associated files it's in, you know, or if we have a script that we want to see, do we have this script in every single file or is it missing in some file? So basically, long story short, a system structure file that populates from using the design functions is super duper useful. And, hmm. and the other thing, it doesn't give you the other thing that you were requesting there, the ability to in the system structure, it does give the ability to validate your naming convention we in getting back to the naming convention, two things that I look for in a naming convention, one is consistency and the other is quality. And, uh, you know, obviously we have opinions on naming convention. One of the things that I like to do with fields, for example, is to embed some metadata. And it's a little bit, you know, makes the fields a little funny to look at. If you're a user, on the other hand, if you're a developer and you see a field that's got a suffix of underscore CT, I'll know by looking at it that that's a calculated field because of the C, that it's unstored because of the U, and that it's returning a text value. And that visibility into the code objects that I'm working with when I'm in the layout mode or the script is, I find, incredibly useful. Um, hmm. Couple thoughts there. 
Thank you, Tony. Small project at the moment where I need to go through and change the currency symbol for the field object on the layout from pounds to dollars. Although it's in the DDR, most of the DDR tools don't pick it up as a an element. Although I can search the DDR itself, but there's no real tool to say, here's my FileMaker file, go and find this unique character, replace it with something else, and off we go, which is kind of the same sort of thing as saying, I want to get rid of all my Z or Z underscores through field names. Yeah, I really hope you're not starting from a a, a US-based currency or anything like that, because I don't want to have to find dollar sign in a DDR because then you get tangled up with all the variables. Yeah. Yeah, I'm Wait. coming from pounds to dollars. Okay. Uh, and you have that in the formatting, uh, Darren? You have that in the formatting, the field formatting option? Yes, on the layout object field mm. formatting. Yeah. Uh, the the currency is defined as pounds. I see. Uh, I've um, I've had some finance projects where um, I've I've uh, extracted I've left the number field as a number without any dollar sign in front of it, and because we have different currencies that we need to display, I've had another attribute that describes the currency that it is being shown. And so like, if it's like in euros, we would say, okay, this is in euros. So we would show euros, but we also have another field that we have the currency symbol. So it's outside of the formatting. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then the number just is a number field, like as a decimal using the system setting. So that means uh, someone in Europe looking at that um, d you know uh, amount in euros would see it not only with the label eur and the euro symbol next to it um, or just one or the other but then you would also have the formatting for the number field to show in the in their system settings so if they're in um, uh, France, it would be one period, and you know, like if you're talking about a thousand two hundred, it would be one dot two hundred, um, I believe. So, um, yes, yeah, so I don't. Uh, that's one way, maybe to get around the issue. Maybe that sounds good. It's, it's already on the layout, and it's also on the y axis for some charts as well because that's got the same attribute as an option so yeah it's it's an option of either stripping it out and putting in another method in or just replacing it for what it is but it would be great to do a a search and replace inside mm -hmm. the file maker file itself yeah, yeah this is uh jim branham i had uh <clears throat> on the topic we were talking earlier about uh, controlling access or within privilege sets, something that's been a while since I've done it, but it worked quite effectively for uh, a solution that involved access by multiple departments that could see each other's records, but only edit their own. And <clears throat> they notice in managed security, uh, when you navigate to the extended privileges, that you can create new extended privileges. And so the basis was I actually created additional extended privileges and tested uh, for the presence of the extended privilege uh, in the uh, return value of get extended privileges. And by virtue of that, I could uh, customize who could perform which scripts and the like without triggering a lot of the extra error codes uh, because um, uh, if you if you go hard into the uh, security model you can find you know editing who the privileges for executing certain scripts to be rather cumbersome but uh, 
rather than even creating a separate table uh, by user of what they could do, uh, just actually add the attributes uh, for the extended privileges onto the various privilege sets and say so that added some additional degree of, of functionality. But I haven't seen that in anybody else's solution where they actually add their own custom or extended privileges. So well, I, I, I've done that uh, in, in, in the past. Um, and custom uh, extended privileges are, are great to, to achieve that because um, they they are live. So if you need to say add um, a privilege to to a given user or actually not a user because in in the case of extended privileges they apply to the whole privilege set. So to a user group, um, as as you perform the change, either you adding it or revoking. Um, it's effective right there and then that the user don't have to to um, log out and log back in for the change to take effect. So that's that's great. Um, oftentimes, though, I, I find myself handling that um, somewhere else in in globals because I I need to uh, bona fide that with something that's going to be exclusive to a given user and and not to 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 the whole group or because of the way the the UI implements the um, the security management um, uh, editing uh, the uh, the external uh, I'm sorry the extended privileges is um, is not really something that that would be uh, easy to do and and while we're on the topic of manage um, I think it it would be welcomed if um, if the UI for managing external privilege extended privileges uh, was was revisited because it's uh, it's pretty pretty strict in terms of what you get um, the the items are listed in the order you created them and of everything that you can name in FileMaker it has the the most uh, constraints in terms of the characters that you can or cannot use. Yeah, so thanks, uh, Eric, for, for sharing the screen here. So yeah, if, if you go on and add something new, um, you can you can name it, but once it's named, you cannot reorder it. And in terms of, yeah, the characters that are, I think even underscore is not allowed. Um, All right, wow. Yeah. That's the, uh... all right. Uh... Oh, wow. So well, that's he, not... yeah, only that's letters, right. uppercase or lowercase, and numbers, nothing else. Not a space, not an underscore, not uh, a special characters, just what's on the screen there, up to 100 characters. And once you create it, you know, it sits there in the creation order. You have no other option of, um, of seeing it in any different order, grouping or anything, it, none. So, um, I'd, I'd be glad if if this was to be uh, spruced up a little bit. Huh. Yeah, it's possible. It just doesn't get enough attention because not a lot of people use it. I think. I'm I'm surprised here actually that uh, over here it looks like it wants to sort them by by keyword. That's it. So, yeah. Uh, okay. I don't know if it stay if it sticks like that after I leave, but mm -hmm. anyway, just just on the naming end, it it's so tight that it, it's very difficult for me to say. Yeah, I'll I'll rely on that. But it's great because, like I said, it's it's live. You know, it, it's native security. If if you want to to use it, it it's a great part of the. Of the toolkit to uh, to use. Also, uh, okay. perhaps in in things that have changed over time. Um, I mean, before FileMaker Seven, uh, I, I hear that when when that change was introduced, going from FileMaker Six to FileMaker Seven, some people were missing uh, 
having a menu where they would see relationship listed as a list, not as a, a relationship graph. So I don't know if anyone wants to comment on, on that. So you can actually find your relationships? <laughs> well, it was very different. I, I don't have a screen capture from back then, but you know, you, you had uh, a single table per file. So it would list the relationships of your given table to any other file. Um, and basically everything was one hop away. You know, you couldn't really, if it was to hop away, you needed to go look in the other file for, for the next hop, you know? So, um, I, I have not been working, uh, with, with Foundry Curve prior to, to version seven, a, a whole lot. And, and it was making it very difficult for me to understand how someone could be missing something like that. Uh, but at times I, when we're looking at the graph and, and it can get um, a bit overwhelming to, especially to find a, say a, a given name. Sometimes, you know, the exact name you're looking for, you don't know where it is on the graph. So um, yeah, just, just curious to, to know. What it was a big, were. it was a big change. I remember those days when we went from FileMaker six to FileMaker seven, you know, for anyone who had all the six and before experience, it, it was a dramatic change. Um, that said, uh, and this kind of ties in, uh, when I saw the topic, I thought, well, that's an interesting topic for a meeting. And I thought, you know, everything in terms of managing, in my opinion, gets much, much easier if you use Anchor Buoy. So I just want to put that on the record. Anchor Buoy makes your life simple. And I remember as we, as a community, um, uh, all kind of work together to figure out how to make use of these awesome uh, new features that came with seven, uh, which also came with like a whole new paradigm. Um, there was a lot of um, unified uh, recently, there does seem to be some substantial research in terms of anchor buoy being more scalable. Uh, and that's been our experience as well. And as a side benefit, it, it does make uh, naming conventions for layouts easier. If you're going to put little uh, um, emojis to indicate whether a relationship uh, can create, sort, or delete, uh, that actually becomes easier when Anchor Buoy because you basically simplify back to more of a FileMaker 6 paradigm where you, you kind of sacrifice the multidirectional aspect that was offered up in FileMaker 7. But in return for that sacrifice, you get a simplicity that cascades through the entire architecture. Anchor buoy for the win. Mm -hmm. um, and then final thought, when the when the relationship graph came, came on, it was different. And I, being a kinesthetic type person, visual auditory, but primarily kinesthetic, I was I looked at the relationship graph as a pond, and you would stand on a table of currents as if you were standing on a rock. And then you would see from that rock which uh, other rocks, aka table of currents, you could to uh, and that's how I got my head wrapped around the um, relationship graph, which I like. C good job, whoever built it. You know, it's kind of funny though. If we Matt Navarre when we were talking about uh, you know what we were getting, if we were going to do a duel with Anchor Boy versus other things, but there were like too many choices, so we couldn't have like a one-on-one -on -one duel with that. It's like unified. Well, there were like uh, the white paper out of there were like twenty, no ten. Uh, Ray Culligan had 10, but, uh, you only need to know one. Yeah. I think, I think, uh, it's not a duel. It's just, uh, anchor buoy against the bunch. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, Keith Proctor actually gave a pretty good argument against it, uh, at one of our meetings. Um, against what? Anchor buoy? Yeah. <laughs> really? Oh. I, I, yeah. I talked with Clay. I mean, uh, Hansa out of the Czech Republic. Uh, at one of the dev cons, I was talking with him, comparing notes. He did, you know, and he publicized this, so I'll just repeat what he said with attribution. They had a really, really big system to run the business. They refactored it from unified down to anchor buoy. They got a two x speed bump, and then they did they connect. They did one thing. They connected. Uh, they went to uh, what's that other thing? Um, uh, the the new one, connector. selector, selector connector. connector, you know, which is, you know, arguably great for whatever use case it fits, 
But as soon as they connected it, establishing where all tables were connected to all tables, which multiplied the paths with factorial math, they went, they lost 2x. So that just rolled them back. And that was empirical evidence that in a large system, the mathematics of factorial math um, indicate that anchor buoy is superior for big systems or systems that might one day grow to be big. So anchor buoy for the win. But, you know, I, I'd love to be in a presentation where Keith Proctor, um, I, I don't think I've met him, but I hear he's a real smart guy. I'm trying to think about having him present but, once, right? So, so uh, Eric, you mentioned for a while was, you know, it doesn't matter what naming convention you use, as long as you have a naming convention and that naming right. convention is anchor buoy. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Um, yeah. Okay. One one other thing I'd love to see oh. be able to manage uh, is hosts. Uh, does mm. or maybe I'm maybe I'm missing something. Does anyone know if there's a way to reorder your hosts menu for those of us that are developers and work with a lot of different servers? I think I've seen that question not answered before. Yeah, the I easiest thing to, to do is to delete all your hosts and start <laughs> over. That's the easiest I found. <laughs> or, or edit the p list if you uh if you get to it i guess but yeah, yeah it's there'd, uh, there'd be dragons uh, oh yeah. somebody mentioned hansa right um, yeah it was tony yeah um and he's actually we've confirmed him for next month by the way so he'll Great. be speaking with us mostly about uh PDF uh, manipulation uh native not having to do any plugins or anything as far as i can tell um uh so if you have any hansa questions go ahead and bring them hmm. yeah. and and i have to say uh just uh surfing on, on what sean said about uh maybe there is a, a missing uh um manage menu for hosts uh I'd, I'd also be curious um to to know what people think of um something to like manage add-ons i know it's there technically. It's just not in the menu, um, and I I haven't been like packaging add-ons like by by the bunch in in the files I'm I'm working with. But maybe there is a need. I, I I'm not familiar enough to to know. Uh, so I'm just curious about what people would say about that. Hmm. Sounds um, like everyone's been playing with add-ons just as much as I have. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't. Um, I don't have anything on add-ons. But if I'll, I'll go back one topic to say one of the techniques that I use here, which I find useful, is uh, so I work on different projects, and for each project that I work on, I have an FMP URL protocol. It's called by an Apple script. It's a simple Apple script. It's like basically open location, and then you just give it the FMP URL protocol. Um, and that works. And you can even pass them around from developer to developer. FMP URL, <laughs> FMP URL for the win. Great feature. It is. Uh, I wanted to circle back on this test I did. I, I created a custom function and I set it to only accounts assigned full access privileges. Yeah. Well, that was really bugging uh, you. Huh? Basically, basically, hello world is the, the string. And uh, I, have a, I have a script that runs the, the dialog. And what? then I have a re-login as admin and re-login as user. So obviously, if I'm logged in as user, I'm not full access, but over here I am. So if I run it with full access and you know okay. prove that I, I am with full access, obviously I'm going to get hello world. Mm -hmm. What do you think I'm gonna get if I run it as user? Well, by the way it reads, I would say you wouldn't have access. What about the question mark? Hmm? Oh, nice. Oh. Ah. <laughs> Very so. interesting. I didn't know. And so then... and and just to just to prove the point, uh, that script is not running 
uh, full access. What? Wait a second. Are you saying it doesn't work at all? It doesn't work at all. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Unless I did, unless I, unless I, you guys see anything I did wrong, uh, but it doesn't seem to work. I would expect it to, to, re to not return, to either return nothing or to return a question mark. And maybe because, yeah. Or maybe it, it's not meant to do what we think it's meant to do, so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, wait, maybe you don't have access to put it in a, is it, well. What's the, document say, what's the documentation saying about that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, what does the documentation say about it? Yeah, let's see. We're digging into the feature no one uses. <laughs> this would be a great way to do certification tests. No, no, no said, it, it, it should be a question <laughs> for a certification, right? So, um, well, it's kind of just taken for granted for, on everything else. It, it's, I mean, there's a minority of people who actually make custom functions, and then there's a very, very small minority who would even attempt to. Here, if you, here it is. Uh, you must have full access privileges to the currently active database to create. Okay. The custom yeah. Protected. Uh, protected. Okay. Okay. Looks like it locks down the ability to edit a calculation. So, oh, yeah. I see. So that's all. Oh, but I mean, I that I mean, is wait a minute. A really rare case then. I mean, yeah, how often I mean, do you give somebody access to edit a calculation? Like, I mean, if I'm not full access, I can't get there anyway. So how would I ever so bother? You, if no, you to have, edit like, a, if, like another you, calculation somewhere else. If you were, it. if you were given, like, if you go into security and give the right to that user to manage scripts, okay. Um, so. Yeah, that is, so it, it makes, it makes sense. Like, um, I think that was Robert who said manage scripts because then the person managing the script would have access to the calculation engine, but they wouldn't, I guess, be able to add that custom function to a script and then whatever. So the Use thing it. that you did, uh, it's still behind a script. Uh, anyway, it's a great feature. Don't know how it works, <laughs> but it's great. <laughs> you could also have a situation where you're using evaluate uh, uh -huh. somewhere where there's user supplied data. So this would prevent the user from being able to use that custom function there in order to return a result. Mm. I see. So, uh, I guess another thing, if you had, if you had uh, those huge recursive uh, custom functions as well, you may not want just everybody using that any way that you want to. And if you give someone access to scripts, you can make that granular. So, whoever set up the security, when you when you drill down, you turn. It turns out that they did it really, really well. So you could give someone access to create their own scripts, but not certain you know there's a subset of scripts that you've created that they can't access so if they can't access the script and they can't access the custom function then you've locked them out of the intellectual property or the secrets that are embedded therein somebody okay. put a lot of thinking into this yep well it looks like we're gonna be on our last few minutes here we got a Has uh, anybody had uh, a run across the problem where their company has changed their outgoing SMTP server uh, to use a whitelist? Uh, I have a solution for that since our company did that. Oh, uh, that might be with, is it using, is it Google? Email? No, no, I work, 
at Lawrence Lab, uh, yeah. Livermore. But the the issue had to do with they changed uh, from basically a trusting uh, SMTP server without uh, using encryption to one that required each host uh, to uh, what they call it an email forwarder to the SMTP site uh, to be explicitly listed by um, the fully qualified machine name and the IP address in their whitelisting system. And uh, for many of us for many years, we thought that say send mail via SMTP server was actually something that used the FileMaker server, uh, but uh, th that's not the case. There's actually a email forwarding client built into FileMaker Pro uh, that is being used when you use that on the send mail script. And the alternative is that you actually use your desktop uh, or the defined mail program for your operating system as the, as the choice, and it tries to, to use that as the client. But uh, yes, the send mail via the SMTP uh, actually comes from FileMaker Pro and goes to the designated SMTP uh, file server on you know, for your company or whichever you're using. So th the problem is every user then needs to be added to this whitelist and tons of stuff broke and it sort of came across uh, suddenly to many of us who didn't realize that yes, we would registered all our servers but uh, it was really a requirement to register all your clients as well. Well, that didn't wow. go over very well. And so I developed <laughs> a script to uh, uh, send the mail, uh, send mail via the server using perform script on the server um, where there's attachment involved. Those of you who know that uh, exporting field contents uh, for a container field does not, is not supported at least through FileMaker server 18 and 19. Uh, 19.1 anyway, but the idea is that uh, if you need attachments for this to work, you need to actually run a pre script on the server, save it to the documents folder, for instance, a known, known file path. And what I did it, for those applications that I had multiple on the server, I defined their own folder within the documents folder and FileMaker server so that at least the, the trashiness is not quite as bad. And so uh, where there's an attachment, uh, a pre-script is run via perform script on server, saves the attachment. And I use uh, JSON uh, as the script parameter uh, to be passed to the script executed on that server. And that works extremely well. And you basically just define all of the fields you would uh, working backwards from the, the send mail step and you send that as a JSON payload and then unpack it uh, at the uh, uh, the part that actually runs on the server. So at the very least you have a the file path that you're passing. Uh, that has worked extremely well and has gotten around the need to register all of our individual FileMaker clients uh, to this new whitelist and create a whole new uh, line of business for people of just trying to keep people up to speed on which systems are registered and which are not. But it's not necessarily an obvious issue if you've never confronted it. Um, the other part of that is we've been converting over from 32 to 64 bit Microsoft Office. And those of you know, you have to have the same bitness of your FileMaker client as your uh, Office client if you're using Outlook. And if they're different, uh, it does not work. The MAPI versions, which is the Microsoft uh, Mail Application Pro Protocol or Programming Interface, is bit specific. Um, and so that's created tons of problems. So people were trying to uh, jump onto the send via SMTP. And it was sort of like uh, that old game of Frogger. Uh, where you ended up uh, jumping onto uh, an alligator and <laughs> instead of another log to make it to the cross the uh, the pond, as it were. But uh, anyway, we're we're working through it. But there's any number of little pitfalls there. But I thought I'd at least add that there is a, a way around that for those of you who work for companies who are implementing tighter outgoing mail security. Did you did you post that anywhere? By the way, that that solution. No, I have no, I have not. No. Oh. 
That sounds like a good one. Huh? I'd stick that on the community. Well, one thing you want to watch out, this is Taylor Sharp, um, kind of the future of um, email, at least according to Microsoft and Google, is that they're going to eventually get rid of IMAP, POP, and SMTP, and it's going to all be RESTful APIs for several reasons, one being security and two being it's easier on the network. Uh, and so basically, uh, you know, looking, you know, five, ten years down the road, uh, those uh, will basically be replaced completely by APIs in the same way we use insert from URL and curl calls. Uh, already, you can do a lot of those things with things like MailChimp and SendGrid and Amazon have uh, API services, but so does uh, Google and Microsoft and be looking for the future of email. If you're trying to look for something that's going to be around for years in the future, you might want to look for uh, if the mail server you're working with has a RESTful API, because that will probably outlast SMTP, MAP, and uh, POP. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea, because I can't tell you how many problems we've had and have and continue to have to deal with because of incompatibilities or issues uh, between uh, Outlook and FileMaker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Eric, uh, I think you said you were. We were close to the uh, the end of the meeting, and and I, I joined late, so I, I missed if there were uh, any announcements at the beginning. But I, I just want to say, uh, for for anyone who may have joined uh, later than than myself, or or I think, uh, if if anyone is is not aware, uh, it's time to register for uh, Claris Engage Beyond. Um, that will be. Uh, 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 having sessions uh, as early as next month. So uh, oh, yeah. just uh, I'll, I'll put uh, the link for registration in the chat. And, uh, well, thanks. Yeah, Rosemary mentions uh, about the uh, keynote coming up in the register for that at the very least. Wonderful. OK, and, and how long do we have to wait for a next California-based user group meeting? Uh, there's one tomorrow. Uh, LA, for those of you traveling down the coast from San Francisco via Zoom, there will be a meeting tomorrow. Uh, and they put on a good show. I'll have to try that. Yeah. It's uh, Be that? Beverly doing something on, I believe, XML, Beverly Voss. Beverly? And, really? uh, Great. Yeah. And uh, very tired. But there's going to be a presentation. Um, uh, Jason. Yeah, and, and also from uh, Jeremy Brown, I think. Yeah, I am oh. tired. Yeah, she's going to talk about the new JSON uh, yeah. bracket, bracket notation stuff. And there is people yeah, using yeah, that that have to be up to three periods in your names. Now, that, that bracket change also broke a bunch of things in the past for me. And <laughs> now I'm having to code things depending on which version you're using but anyway it, it's a good change but there's some pain yeah so who's changed with that i don't know <laughs> with that i think we should call it a night yeah yeah I'm, I'm fading <laughs> and i want to thank <laughs> rosemary <laughs> Vince is nice. <laughs> uh i want to thank rosemary thank everyone here who was part of the discussion and all of all the people listening in. Thank you for attending and I look forward to the next meeting. Thanks. Co copying out all the chat so that you guys can oh, yeah, yeah. see that over on the community. Thank you. Reporting. Thanks for the show. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Or morning. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>